I visited Alaska. In Morocco, right by the Sahara Desert. Standing at the summit of Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. I woke up one night and walked out and... It's 70 below. My first thought was that it was snowing. Literally every direction you look, even down a little bit below the horizon line, there are stars. I've never seen anything quite like that, and I don't, I really haven't ever seen anything quite like that since. The words do not do justice to what that experience is like. More than 80% of the planet has a compromised view of the night sky. We live under a sky that is so flooded with man-made light that it has severed our natural connection to the cosmos. It's always been part of us, but now we're erasing it. So the way that we normally define light pollution is we say that it's any form of outdoor light at night that produces some sort of adverse impact. After the Industrial Revolution and the invention of the light bulb, the stars began to recede into the light of cities. Our economy really took off. That's when our city started to brighten up very rapidly. feet above Tucson, Arizona sits the Mount Lemmon Sky Center, the astronomy arm of University of Arizona. They hold public viewing sessions and host astronomers and observers at the site. Their location allows observers to get away from the interfering lights from Phoenix and Tucson that limit their viewing of the night sky. Carson Pools is an observer at the Mount Lemmon Survey. Originally from Texarkana in East Texas, he grew up being able to see the Milky Way and the bright stars. Observers like Carson have discovered 15,000 near-Earth asteroids, but visibility to the stars is a critical part of these observations. Light pollution doesn't yet affect their observations, but they stay on high alert for the day that it might. Work certainly, I would hate to miss important object, you know, something that's scientifically interesting or, you know, even worse would be a, a small impactor just because it's washed out due to light pollution. Communities around the world have started to combat light pollution to protect both astronomy and our individual connection to the night sky. Flagstaff, Arizona, home of Lowell Observatory, was the first to do so, passing the world's first lighting ordinance in 1958, and they've set an example for other cities to follow. You go to Flagstaff and you'll notice that for the most part, their street lighting is this very yellow, almost orange looking light that's made with a type of a lamp called a low pressure sodium lamp. And the reason that they do that is, rather than emitting all of the colors uniformly like a white light, those lamps emit in just a little narrow part of the spectrum. If you talk to people in Flagstaff, they understand why the streetlights are yellow and not some other color, but they don't have to do a lot of enforcement because people just already kind of get it. Some Flagstaff residents are taking an active role in their own homes to keep the skies dark. Ann Whitkey has lived in Flagstaff for almost 30 years and has contributed to the efforts in the community to combat light pollution. putting better porch lights on the front and back of doors of your house. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Anne is not the only resident who is doing her part to keep the skies dark. Lights Out Flagstaff is an event that brings a community together to celebrate the dark skies, where businesses, homes, and government buildings turn off their own non-essential exterior lights. This community is committed to dark skies. It's essential, it's special, it's a source of pride, and you don't have to uh, twist anybody's arm in Flagstaff to get them to support dark skies. They're already there. Three, two, one, go! The 
Could other cities benefit from the way Flagstaff does what it does? Absolutely. Don't we owe it to future generations to try to solve as many of these problems as we can? I have hope for the future as far as our ability to turn this around if we were really committed to it.